Well, good morning and good afternoon to everyone that's joining us here today at the ISP Supplies webinar. And I'm hoping that the reason you're here today is because you're looking for answers and you're concerned about the scalability of your network. And what we want to present you with today is an opportunity for you to grow your wireless ISP and provide the long-term solution to the type of service your customers demand. So at ISP Supplies, we have developed strategic partnerships with several companies and individuals that can help take you down this path of increased capacity and scalability, especially in the area of license point to multipoint. And in particular, I'm talking about the Telrad LTE product, which has a 2.5 gigahertz license version with very high power and excellent non-line of sight capability. But in order to make use of that, you've got to have Spectrum. And so today we have Bob Finch of Select Spectrum with exciting opportunities for you to get your own piece of the 2.5 band and allow you to scale with a licensed LTE product like Telrad. Now, if you're not familiar with Bob, he is the president of Select Spectrum, which man manages uh, Spectrum auctions and provides transaction advisory and consulting services to organizations. His company has supported over 180 successful Spectrum transitions since 2009. And as far as his background, he's a former VP of Spectrum Development for Nextel and Sprint, and has also worked for Sienna Corporation in mergers and acquisitions, and also the former VP of Engineering for WorldCom. So Bob brings with him today a wealth of experience and relationships that he can use to help you get your own piece of this 2.5 gigahertz spectrum that we have coming down the pike. So at this point in time, I would like to turn it over to Bob. Um, so thank you again for setting this up, um, and thanks to all the participants. It looks like we've got uh, a lot of interest in this topic, uh, which has to please me. I've, I've been involved in license spectrum now since the late 1990s, and uh, uh, it's, I find the topic fascinating, and I hope you find it interesting too. I also uh, believe that it could be very important for many of the ISPs out there if someone started to take advantage. And I do think we have a window over the next several years to get licensed spectrum at moderate cost, uh, and, and that may not last forever. So in terms of the topics that I'm going to cover today, um, the, this is the outline. The first I'm going to discuss is pros and cons of licensed spectrum. Uh, I'll, I'll do a quick summary of the technology. Uh, I'm not really a tech. My background is engineering, but I'm by no means an RF engineer. So um, you'll, you'll sort of get the introduction, and you'll want to follow it up with people like Steve and ISP Supplies. Uh, I'll take you through a reasonably detailed summary of uh, spectrum licenses. And, you know, there's, there's lots of layers to this onion, but we'll get you to the basic introduction and enough for you to assess whether it makes sense to dig deeper. At that point, we should be maybe not quite halfway through the hour, and my plan is to stop and open it up for at least some questions at that point where we sort of find out whether um, people are, are following or have some significant questions about the basics of the technology and the licensing. And then um, we'll go back into really talking about the spectrum acquisition process. So the second half of this will be much more about if you're interested, what does it take, how much does it cost, how do you participate, how do you uh, get a hold of uh, the license spectrum. Uh, and I think the best way is through the spectrum lease auction that we're holding. There is, uh, There are some additional alternatives I'll talk about that also look promising uh, in the coming year. And at the end, we'll have more time for Q&A. So overall target is uh, up to an hour. So first of all, let's start about the advantage of 2.5 gigahertz license spectrum. In general, the, the green is uh, intended to be some, something to focus on where it, it's good news. Uh, yellow is maybe cautionary as we go through this. So just you, you can see that pop up with the places in this presentation. Uh, the overall advantage, of course, is freedom from RF interference. So within your operating area, within your spectrum um, license, you will have essentially uh, very high power, uh, the ability to transmit at high power and to know that nobody else will be there with any significant signal. 
which should enable you to deliver not just line of sight like you're used to, but not line of sight, longer distances, cleaner and more reliable signal. You'll find that uh, there's lots of equipment uh, that is standards based in this band, uh, and I think that's a good news story and getting better for the reasons I'll discuss, uh, mainly having to do with the, the declining cost over time on a global scale. I think that leads to lower operating costs. We've seen that from a number of the licensed operators. Not necessarily less expensive up front, but over time, the cost should be less expensive than operating an unlicensed network. And one of the significant advantages of 2.5 gigahertz is in terms of the majority of the band and definitely the, the predominant majority of what's left, it's mainly leases, long-term leases that are available as opposed to actually purchasing a license. So the good side of that is it's, it's essentially self-financing. For 10% 10, 10 of the total value of the license, you can get in business, get your lease in place, and then pay the remainder over time out of your revenue. So no need to, to go out and raise all of the money up front. Hey, Bob, a, a couple of complaints about low audio. I don't know if you can get a little closer on the mic or what, but uh, okay. it might help. I will, I will place it. Oh, much better. Here. The mouse. Yeah, better. It's a little directional here. Hang on. Okay, let's see if that makes a difference. A little better? Yeah, a lot better. And also notice that uh, there may be like a chat window or something covering part of the slide on the right hand side. Maybe just slide that down. Okay. Yeah, uh, that's uh, that's the okay. audio connection description. So I will uh, try and keep great. that out of the way. Okay, great. Continue. Sorry. No, no problem. Thank you. So, um, the significant advantage in terms of lower operating costs, I think we just we discovered that built in financing. Uh, importantly, uh, when investors or lenders look at your business, they have to be concerned uh, if they understand unlicensed spectrum and or lightly licensed spectrum and the risks as more and more use of that spectrum is made by a whole variety of entities, including the, the licensed wireless carriers who are increasingly using unlicensed spectrum to offload capacity. And because of that, I think investors will be, and we've seen investors have valued businesses with licenses much more highly than those that are totally unlicensed. And so that's a significant plus. And then over time, if you want to, and I don't think this is for everybody, but there's the option to get into uh, mobile businesses as well. Uh, and uh, so you could potentially uh, be the rural provider for an AT&T or a Verizon or a Sprint. Okay. So, uh, with all, advantage, with all spectrum, there are disadvantages, uh, licensed or unlicensed. Uh, the first, of course, that everyone will recognize is that there is a cost to maintaining this license. Uh, and uh, that, uh, we'll describe that later. It's a moderate cost, but, but there is a cost. Uh, secondly, uh, the equipment today is slightly more expensive than unlicensed uh, at either 2.4 or 5.8. We are seeing, though, that that cost difference is coming down. Each license is typically 22 and a half megahertz. We'll go through the, the band plan later. So you may need multiple licenses to really deliver the full capacity that you want to see overall. And the licenses are not available everywhere. So um, that's, that's potentially a, a problem as well. That's probably the most significant problem. Uh, but again, we, we expect the FCC to be opening up more licensing in areas, not everywhere, but in, in especially rural areas where there have not been licenses in the past. So this problem between the auction that we're holding and the upcoming uh, to be licensed space, we think will be declining. Um, okay, so, sorry. So here's the band plan um, that we can see. Uh, in here, there are salmon-colored colored channels, kind of pinkish. Those are the educational channels. 
there are five groups of them, A, B, C, D, and G. Uh, the typical, it, each of the educa these educational groups are a total of 22 and a half megahertz. Uh, if you look at the A123 on the left-hand side of the chart there, you'll see that there's uh, 16 and a half megahertz, three channels of five and a half each. And then there's an A4 in the mid-band separate uh, that is six megahertz, so a total of 22 and a half. Each of the educational channels are set up that way. On the right of the chart are the blue channels. Those are the commercial channels, mostly held by Sprint at this point, although not everywhere. Uh, they, they can be purchased, they can be bought and sold, uh, as opposed to the educational channels. I'll describe the eligibility for those later, but effectively for commercial entities, you can really only lease the educational channels. And um, the BRS1 and 2 in the green on the left side uh, near 2496, and 2614 are also commercial channels. So that's the total band plan. Typically, when you would acquire a license or rights to a license, you would end up with 22 and a half megahertz. And that will vary uh, in some cases according to individual availability and how the licensing was done over time. So if you were to end up controlling all of the spectrum in your particular area, would be 194 megahertz, including these uh, guard bands, which uh, if you get all, you don't have to worry about the guard bands, you can use those too. Uh, so it's a huge amount of capacity, much greater than any other of the bands that are used by mobile wireless carriers. So in terms of geographic coverage, uh, here's a typical example that the radius of that circle is 35 miles. This is uh, one of the licenses that's going to be available in the upcoming auction. It uh, So 70 mile diameter. You'll notice it's cut off on the southwest corner. So the reason for that is that originally these licenses were for television. In the days of television, it was okay to have overlapping licenses because the user just uh, had a directional antenna and just pointed at whichever tower uh, he wanted to use. The tower in the original licensing was dead center in the middle of, of the license. Then they changed to mobile licensing. And so there's going to be, in many cases, m multiple towers spread around the uh, licensed area. And the users, particularly in the sprint environment, are not necessarily going to have directional antennas. So they took all of the overlapping areas and essentially cut them in half. If you look at, at two circles overlapping, if you can imagine the, the circle that's based uh, just southwest of Decatur in this example. Uh, those two overlapping areas would look kind of like a football, and they just slice the football in half. Cut the football is, is a term that you'll hear used by people who work in this band regularly. So that's an example of um, a given licensed area there in the purple. In the, in the kind of brownish color, you'll see what is proposed as expansion area. So this is according to an expansion proposal I'll be describing in more detail. But the National EBS Association, which is the entity that represents educational holders in the band and the commercial organization called the Wireless Communications Association International and the, a couple other groups have gotten together to petition the FCC to say, hey, it is silly to have these unlicensed areas. Rural areas demand broadband. Most of the unlicensed areas are in rural territories. Uh, the FCC already auctioned off the commercial spectrum, but the educational spectrum is just unlicensed. Why don't we let the existing holder of the license expand and cover any portion of a county that they partially cover? So that's what you see going on here. In the areas where you end up not going to county lines, it's, it's more kind of a diagonal. That's because there are other licenses that are also proposed to expand. The idea would be all of the license would, would expand, and any county that has partial coverage on a given channel would now have full coverage for that channel. And we would, by doing that, make these licenses more valuable. We'd fill in the unlicensed space. There'd be more to lease, more to operate in. We think it's a, a very good proposal, and we think the FCC is looking generally favorably at this because it is uh, their objective to provide more bandwidth for use 
uh, for businesses like yours, uh, especially in rural areas. So we, we're optimistic that this is going to move forward. If you look at the example when there's multiple licenses involved, this, this example on the left is um, on the smaller smaller diagram is Mississippi licenses. These were actually all leased in our last auction uh, this past year, released from Mississippi EdNet, which was a consortium of educational holders in Mississippi, to Speed Connect. And so Speed Connect ended up with all of these operating circles and gaps in between them. And so this is a good example of why the proposal is, okay, FCC, let us fill in the gaps. What they would end up after the fact is the area that's shown kind of in brown on the right, almost statewide coverage. And uh, I think it ends up being something uh, on the order of 68 megahertz overall uh, that they that they will have throughout the state of Mississippi. So very, very strong coverage uh, overall. And um, we think that this would be a good thing. The FCC is looking at it. We hope they will issue a further notice of proposed rulemaking in the coming months, um, maybe maybe early next year. Uh, we'll see. These things in Washington are always difficult to predict. So the other side is besides the expansion, you know, what about the counties that currently have no coverage? So I looked through, turns out that there's quite a bit of uncovered area in Colorado. You'll see these are a list of counties in Colorado. And uh, this is according to the proposal that was submitted. So if you look at Adams County, there's no ability to apply. Alamosa, there's three groups. Uh, and if you go down to Archuleta County, Colorado, there's no EBS licenses anywhere in that county today. So the proposal would allow for uh, five new applications, four channels each. I think that works out to a little over 112 megahertz that would be uh, made available if this proposal goes goes through. So um, potentially creating lots more spectrum uh, that that would be licensed. The, by the way, the the requirements are this has to be held by either an accredited academic institution, so your local school board or community college or university could apply, uh, or an educational nonprofit. In most cases, I think for ISPs that would want to gain rights to this spectrum, the best way to do it would be to work with your local school board or any entity where you had good contacts in the community encourage them to apply. We think this would be first come, first serve. If they get their application in uh, and beat the others, then you could end up leasing the license from them uh, and it would cover uh, not as much as, but typically not as much as a current license, but it would cover a, an entire county and you could string a, a series of them together to cover a number of adjacent counties. So we, we think that's a pretty exciting opportunity and it's a good reason to step in now to look at leasing spectrum because we think there's more coming down the pike. So in terms of uh, what's happened so far, um, these licenses go way back to, yeah, I think the 60s and 70s. They, they've been around initially as television licenses for a long time. They were converted to mobile broadband licenses in 2004, 2005 timeframe but they can also be used for fixed. So um, besides the Sprint controlled uh, licenses and, and leases, which are mostly in the major cities, uh, Speed Connect is a major uh, kind of the number two uh, license holder. Uh, you will know Jab Broadband, uh, Whisper is another example. Altogether, I was surprised to find out doing this research 45 operators, and this is not just, I've, I've sort of tried to single out the speculators. So this is entities that I think either are operators or would like to be operators are acquiring uh, spectrum rights through leases in the country. There's um, a total of 1,800 leases. Again, most of those are Sprint, but lots with these other entities as well. And uh, so it's, it is a significant asset that's out there and it's more widely distributed than most people realize. So um, we think all right, so what we're approaching in this upcoming auction is an opportunity for more than 500 EBS and BRS licenses, um, mostly EBS. And 
the opportunity to lease those licenses. So maybe is, now is a good time to stop for a moment and see what we have in terms of questions, and then I'd be glad to glad to go on. Okay, so so far there's only one question, and uh, that is this van And I apologize, Steve. I'm going to have to ask you to repeat the question. Question is the band that you're presenting here uh, that become available is it for educational use only? Oh, thank you for asking. So um, it it can only be licensed to educators in terms of the EBS licenses. If we if we go um, back here. Um, and look at the van plan. So the commercial portion, any entity can hold the licenses, but they mostly have been licensed to Sprint. So that's the, the blue and the green. The, um, the salmon color, which is the majority of, of the band, is available for any party. Well, it, it's, it's more generally available, but the only parties that can hold it are educational institutions or educational nonprofits. However, the educators generally don't have a use for it. And so what they do instead, in most cases, is lease the capacity. And that's the reason that what we're talking about next is it called a spectrum lease auction. So the proposal is out of this 194 megahertz, over 100 is in the educational uh, side of the band. All of that can be leased. and while you have to have a limited amount of educational use in order to meet the requirement, that requirement is only 20 hours per channel per week. Any Even a single device using it 20 hours per channel per week uh, meets the minimum educational requirement. And you also have to reserve, uh, they say, 5% of the total capacity for educational use. So effectively, 95% of the capacity of this educational band is available for commercial use. And, you know, Sprint is operating a major network. They've built the majority of their network, uh, well, much of their network, I'd say, using th these spectrum leases. Uh, you can help hold them for up to 30 years, which is the maximum term. So it gives you the sort of comfort that if you build a network on it, uh, it is going to be there and available for your use. Uh, so that's I, we we find you know these these 45 entities that have leases um, we think they are generally looking towards uh, commercial use rather than educational use at, at least primarily commercial use. Okay. And uh, Joe Novak has suggested that I get a new microphone. So this is my new microphone. So I'm sorry for the change. I'll, I'll get a new. Uh, another question here, rough dollar amount expected to be able to be in a rural area. So there, there's the, the dollar question that's coming. There okay. Some ballpark figures. Yeah, so I'm I'm gonna do that as part of the, the webinar here going forward. So if there's no other questions now, let me plow forward and, and we can always yeah. come back, obviously. All right, so um, of the almost 2,200 EBS licenses, uh, according to FCC database, and this is consistent with our own database, there are more than 500 that are either not leased or where the lease is expiring soon. So these are the targets for the current auction. And then in addition, um, we, we hope and the FCC is considering and has indicated at different points that they are at least uh, looking favorably upon this proposal. We hope that all of the, well, most of those existing EBS licenses would expand to fill gaps in the partly covered areas. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, expand this so you can see it better. And that, um, or any county that has channels that are not currently licensed in the EBS. So there's, there are, it's a county where there is on at least one EBS channel, there is no existing license, not, not covering any portion of the county, then new applications would be accepted. 
And that's actually 900 counties out of the 3,144 counties and equivalents in the U.S. So nearly a third of the counties would be uh, become available for new applications, and some of them would be uh, available for five new applications. They're totally uncovered today by EBS licenses. So it's kind of a first step uh, in terms of timing is is have a look at this auction, and second step is we think we hope. Uh, FCC will um, license this to educators and allow, allow them, as they have in the past, to lease the, the channels. So let me talk what, about what we did in the last Spectrum auction, just uh, to kind of help confirm our ability in this. This is part of what we're using to motivate existing license holders to participate in the 2015 auction. Uh, we offered 109 licenses total, 75 were direct by Select Spectrum, 34 were by other parties, and I'll talk about that uh, in this conference as well. Uh, we have, for example, uh, Liz Creekmore and Rick Harnish, who are acting as, I'll call them agents, uh, that are working with Select Spectrum. They can sign you up to participate in this. Uh, and and it'd be the same deal, essentially, or exactly the same deal as you might get if you came directly to Select Spectrum. But um, Select Spectrum is trying to become more and more focused on running these auction processes, and kind of emphasizing our efforts on bringing in the license holders and getting them to participate. And that's part of the reason we're encouraging work with other brokers and other parties who know the business to encourage more and more participation in the auction. So uh, of the ones we offered, we 85% of those were leased. Uh, the new leases covered nearly 11 million POPs. A substantial portion of that was rural. Um, you can see the areas here, some urban areas in South Florida, but mostly rural overall. And uh, we felt that you know the overall uh, auction was quite successful. So. In terms of the 2015 auction, I'm sure you'll all be asking, well, where are the licenses going to be? We don't have all of these yet. These are the targets. In fact, we don't have the majority of these yet. These are, these are the targets. Um, these are the licenses that, according to our research so far, and we have a little more to do, but according to our research uh, so far, uh, these are not subject to a long-term lease. So they're either unleased or they are, um, the existing lease will be expiring over the next uh, zero to four years. And we think um, that participants, should, if you look at this and say, hey, it looks like there is a license in my area, we encourage you to sign up, get involved with the auction. We'll provide more information on the specific license uh, and we'll provide details uh, related to the coverage area and the number of people uh, involved, and that'll help you estimate the dollar value and, and what a fair bid would be. So, um, and I'll, I'll get to in a moment helping people assess, okay, how much should I start to think about budgeting uh, if I want to participate in this? So, uh, to reiterate, the auction will include existing EBS licenses that are, that are not subject to a current lease. Um, some of those are being used by schools for telecommunications purposes, but most are not really being used very much. And oftentimes the educational use, if, if you make a bid, you could, you could uh, use the spectrum for your own purposes and use a small portion to meet that educational requirement. Uh, there's also uh, a significant number of the 500 that are existing leases that will expire. And so your opportunity is essentially to step in and uh, become the new lessee after the current lease expires. We, we also have some existing leases held by other commercial entities that will be offering to sell their lease. So if they are paying $500 a month, you can buy the lease, take it over, continue to pay the $500 a month, and now you're the new tenant and can use it to build your, the network uh, that you want. And then we'll also have uh, BRS, these commercial licenses. You can actually purchase those licenses or potentially you could lease them as well. Uh, the plan is to hold this auction in October 
of 2015. Uh, we want to uh, make sure that we use a little bit of the beginning of the school year to sign up any of the educational institutions that haven't finished signing up. And uh, there's a lot of information that we're going to be assembling and distributing to the bidders. So that's that's the time we're taking from now till October to get this all set up. Okay, a uh, question relating to the value. So uh, this is, um, the values vary a great deal. Uh, in general, um, I guess the thing to look at is the megahertz pop. Uh, that is the unit of measure for how much spectrum you are potentially leasing. The, the way it's calculated is to take the total number of megahertz in the license and multiply by the population of the covered area. And that tells you it's the equivalent of gallons or bushels or pounds. It tells you how much of the quantity that you're buying. Um, but the price per megahertz pop varies according to how much supply and demand there might be in a, in a given area. And, you know, one of the objectives of this is to help the schools reach the conclusion that they are getting a fair price. They don't really understand what they own. Many times, almost always, the person who applied for this spectrum years and years ago has long since left the school system. Um, and so they're there's a shortage of experts on the educational side. When we run an auction, we give them a competitive process where they feel like, okay, we've run this on a uh, fair and valid basis. And so we can take the result and feel comfortable that we've gotten a good uh, price and we're ready to move forward. So that's one of the purposes of holding this in an auction type format. And we hope that this will become kind of an annual standard where Every, let's say, October, um, the, the schools that have leases that are expiring look to this as a way to um, get fair value for their spectrum and know they have a fair process. So let's look at an example license. This is one that we'd like to include in the upcoming auction. Uh, it's uh, centered near Stillwater, Oklahoma, which is north of Oklahoma City and east, I'm sorry, west of Tulsa. Uh, in that seven county area, it, is, it covers uh, all of the county that includes Stillwater and portions of the adjacent counties. Uh, there are 120,000 people uh, who have their residences there. So if you multiply that 120,000 people times the bandwidth of the license, it's 22 and a half megahertz altogether, you get 2.7 million megahertz pops. So from there you say, okay, you know, what is that worth? Well, 2.7 million pops, in this case, I selected as an example, and the actual bid could be lower or higher, the final clearing price, we're not sure. I've seen deals above this and below this, uh, way above this and quite a bit below this, depending on how much competition and interest and willingness to lease there there is. Um, but if you multiply four cents times 2.7 million, you get $108,000. And to come up with a lease that has that same net present value, so we do a, a discounted cash flow kind of model, the 10% discount rate. Um, we require at least a 10% upfront payment. That's part of the auction requirements. Uh, one of the things it does is it pays us for our services. So that includes all of the commissions to all of the agents that are involved in the in the and and to select spectrum as part of the auction um, and then you know run it out it's okay experiment with different numbers until you get the right one and we can give you a spreadsheet that will let you go through this you come out to an initial monthly rent of six hundred and twenty six dollars uh, it's a this proposal is for a 30-year lease the structure of that by the way could be five initial years and then you would have a right to renew each five years. Um, that that right would be the right of the commercial entity. The, the um, edu educator would typically have to just accept whatever whatever the commercial entity decides at each renewal point, um, and an annual increase of three percent. So this is an example. Uh, in a reasonably populated area, it would be less typically in areas that have lower populations and, and obviously could be considerably higher if you were after an urban area. In addition to the cash payments, typically 
you will be required to provide some number of free connections to the educators so that they can make educational use of the spectrum. 10 is a reasonable kind of a number. Sometimes people do it with service credits instead of uh, free connections, but that's an example of what a typical lease would look like in a rural but not super rural area. There are certainly areas with, uh, you know, licenses with a lot fewer than 120,000 people that will be included in the auction. So hopefully that's that's helpful in terms of what the valuation might be. So um, for more information about this, we're gonna have Q&A today, obviously. Uh, we encourage you to sign up um, and we'll be developing an additional information and providing it to bidders. Maybe there's a, there's a worthwhile comment here. You know, my our prior business has been to some extent consulting with prospective bidders, prospective uh, spectrum lessees, and trying to find the spectrum that was in their area. We found that um, it wasn't the most efficient process, that we think this ends up with sort of a fairer situation because the party that ends up with the spectrum is the only party that pays anything. And uh, you know, we'll provide essentially all of the same information to the bidders and let you, let you decide. Uh, so we'll we'll give um, we'll give the coverage area, we'll give the maps, we'll provide the population, and uh, really give you lots of information that will help you craft a bid. Uh, and we've also got uh, Liz Creekmore and Rick Harnish who are prepared to um, work with you to help you understand the process, uh, to sign you up uh, for uh, participating in the auction. And we thought that having someone who understands your business and has the right contacts would sort of streamline the process of, of um, providing this information and help present it in a more useful form. And they've already provided some great insight to me uh, as we've sort of developed this auction process. So that is my recommendation. Here's, here's the contact information from them. We'll certainly talk to you as well, uh, but Again, we're trying to focus our in activities more on, first of all, developing the database of all this information, and secondly, signing up the license holders to participate in the auction. So that's gonna be our primary effort over the coming couple of months as we lead up into the auction period. So with that, I think I wanna, first of all, say thank you again uh, to Steve, to ISP Supplies, and to all of you who've been listening and I'm very much interested in your questions. All right, so probably the uh, best thing to do is back to slide number six. Um, okay. And that will help you answer this question. So the question is that uh, when we explain the band, 16.5 megahertz plus six megahertz equals 22.5, but the last six is split off from the first the Does the equipment use all 22 and a half, just individual 5.5 or 6 megahertz slices, or how do we speak? Okay, so it's a very good question. Uh, I'm going to give a couple of examples because I've seen people do it in, in different ways. So, first of all, if you're buying WiMAX or LTE gear, it typically comes in multiples of 5 megahertz. So uh, 5, 10, and 20 are kind of common carrier sizes. So I've got a, a client um, who's actually, he's operating on some spectrum, but he's also got some spectrum that he's gonna put up for sale in this auction. And I believe that he's got a single group and, and he uses a three sector approach. And so let's say he's got uh, A1, A2, A3, and A4. He, he has the three sector approach. Each of his towers has three five megahertz carriers using A1, A2, A3. And then whichever sector is the busiest on that tower, he puts an additional carrier in there for an additional five megahertz carrier. So that's one approach. Uh, I've got another uh, client who's worked with me in the past. And he says, you know, I always want to try to get to adjacent channel groups. And so in that case, let's say he would have um, the C and the D 
just for an example. So if you have C and D together, you have a total of 16 and a half plus 16 and a half in the lower band, 33 megahertz. You could put three 10 megahertz carriers in there, or you could put a 20 megahertz carrier plus a 10 megahertz carrier in there. And then you'd have um, an additional 12 megahertz in the mid band. You could put an additional 10 megahertz or two fives. So there, there's different approaches. Um, I think at the larger carriers tend to be slightly more efficient. So wherever you can get adjacent uh, channel groups, that's, that's preferable. And uh, that gives you the option of operating on 10 or 20 megahertz carriers. You can, you can do it. Uh, 10 megahertz in a, or you know, so if you just had the A, like I, my original diagram, instead of using three times five, you could use, you know, a single sector with a 10 megahertz carrier and a five, or a single sector sector with 10 megahertz carrier plus an additional five in the lower band, plus an additional five in, in the upper band. So that there are some ways to um, play around with it depending on what your deployment strategy is, and hopefully that's the kind of thing that ISP supplies and Telrad could help you sort of sort through. I'm kind of the spectrum guy as opposed to the equipment guy. Okay. Next question is, uh, will the devices available in Puerto Rico? And uh, then another question about uh, the FTI listing fair license as well. And you will get to decide whether or not All right, so I'm going to answer the Puerto Rico question, and then I'm going to ask you to restate the other one. So we have looked at Puerto Rico, and our initial conclusion is that there are no licenses uh, that are likely to be available there. And um, but there's so that that's the answer to that one. I we will we could double check, but I don't think the answer is going to change. And okay. Can you can you state the second yeah. one again slowly? So maybe uh, jump up to slide 13. Okay. So the question is, uh, will there be a website or a list somewhere where we can determine where the life is visible? I'm sorry, I didn't understand it. I, 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 I'm not hearing your words clearly. Okay. Is there a website where we can determine uh, where the license is available? So, so for now, the only thing we have available is this map. We're going to provide um, the website access, uh, ultimately uh, focus first on people who sign up to participate in the auction. So, you know, since this is a no charge to, um, to participate unless you win, we would like you to sign the contract that says, you know, if we provide the information and you make a bid for the spectrum, then we'd like to get paid our commission. And so we're, we're not providing uh, to, to parties that haven't signed up to bid. Uh, we're not necessarily providing the individual call signs and maps and all that sort of thing. But we will do that um, and with sort of uh, no obligation if you choose not to bid, that's fine. But um, we would like to uh, limit the amount of information that we provide or uh, un until people actually sign up to uh, to get the information and become prospective bidders. Okay, uh, I'm in the process of trying to dial in as well. Does this sound better? Yes. Okay, great. Um, the next question is, does Sprint, uh, I guess, sublease the EBS licenses? Well, I'm I'm a former Sprint employee, but I left at the end of 2008. Um, I do obviously work in this area a lot. I, they have entertained sublease option, or, you know, uh, discussions, but kind of carefully. I'm not. I think I'm aware of a couple of examples where they may have subleased, and I just don't know don't know any more specifics about that I, and I, I'm not even sure that those actually came to fruition so I I think you'd say you'd have to ask Sprint I will be talking to Sprint and encouraging them to participate in the auction and if they do then we could fill out this um, you know none of these licenses shown on this map are included 
as as part of the Sprint long-term leases. So if they if they offered either their licenses or long-term leases, we could have a lot more. One of my you know hopes when I go to talk to my former colleagues over there is to is to go in with a large number of um, ISPs that have signed up and say, hey, you know, here's parties that are interested, and this could even be you know something that would facilitate Sprint. Um, being more willing to to lease lease or sublease spectrum. Uh, so far, it's been limited, and and you know that we hope will change over time. Okay. Next question: Are there any exclusion zones in 2.5 gigahertz? Um, you know, there's there's the only thing I know of that's a, an exclusion zone is there are there is I think a certain area in I think West Virginia or something like that, that is like the radio quiet zone and all bands are, are supposed to avoid um, use of that that area. Um, I, in general, I think the answer is there's not exclusion zones. There is a whole lot of unlicensed territory, you know, places where there's no existing license. And so effectively those are exclusion zones, but it's not, it's not, a, it's not a protection, it's just they never were licensed. Okay. Uh, the next question I can answer, is the presentation available for download? And the answer is yes. We are recording the presentation. We will uh, put it on our YouTube channel uh, and we'll also be sending out an email to everyone that signed up for today's webinar, giving you links to uh, the presentation as well as the uh, the audio and video portion of it as well. So just stand by and I'll get that email out today. Next question uh, is for Bob and it is, are there any resources for directing a local school or how a school can apply for EBS licenses? Uh, so I, I want to add that the, the uh, download, uh, the PDF of this presentation is also available under our website, uh, which is selectspectrum.com. And if you if you look on the left, there's something that talks about uh, the 2015 Spectrum lease auction, and and the PDF is available there. Um, and in terms of do, dealing with local schools, so there's been a freeze for the last 20 years or something like that on uh, the ability for schools to apply for licenses. So today, they there's no uh, way for them to apply. That's basically this process that's being considered by the FCC. The next step for that will be the, um, we hope, the release of a further notice of proposed rulemaking. And that would come up perhaps this fall at the earliest. Um, and then there would, you know, parties would submit their comments and the FCC would make a decision and issue the actual rules, which we think would not happen until sometime next year at the earliest. I'm sure that's something that WISPA will follow. Um, we intend to follow it as well. But it's, uh, to me, the there's, there's kind of nothing that can be done now beyond if you wanted to make contact with your school and say, well, this, um, I used to live in, in Mississippi, that this might could happen sometime soon. Uh, it, it could be a while before we really hear that um, coming out of, of uh, the FCC. So it's it's a little premature to get the school involved, but depending on the pace with which, you know, that they're – we think you'll have a few months after the actual FNPRM comes out to figure out what you're going to do. And, um, yeah, definitely also uh, put our website on your, on your places to look because um, we expect to – to follow that and provide advice to parties that are interested in participating. I think the question was uh, maybe slanted a little bit differently, and that is, if you are a, are a school district, is there a place, a resource, information that a school district could go to to see about applying for an EBS license? Oh, sure. Um, I guess the place I would first suggest is the National EBS Association, NEBSA, N-E-B-S-A, uh, and, um, you know, they are actively involved in this group. They represent the school districts that already hold licenses, uh, so that would be 
my recommendation. Um, it's a great organization. I think they would admit that, that their website could use a little improvement, so it's not necessarily the best source. There's also, there is a 2.5 gigahertz page that includes BRS and EBS at the, on the FCC website. Um, again, that tends to be a little bit behind. That they don't necessarily keep that um, as being totally up to date. So I, I, those are the resources I can think of. Sorry, I don't have something okay. better for schools. That's fine. Uh, the next question regards areas that aren't shown on your map. Um, how would someone go about finding out who might hold a license in that area and then possibly lease from them? And I think the answer is, uh, I already know, but I'll let you answer that. <laughs> well, I, yeah, um, we've tried to be pretty generous on this map. I mean, we're obviously trying to include as many licenses as possible. So the rest are either unlicensed or held in long-term leases by parties that we think are going to try to hold them and unlikely to part with them. Um, so you can go, I mean, the FCC has uh, the universal licensing system. Uh, it's not the easiest to use, but you can definitely check there. There are, this is, uh, there are some consultants, though not a lot, who maybe could help with this. Um, I, I uh, beyond ULS, I'm not sure what else to re recommend. Okay. Next question says, if we're operating in an area without a current license, and the examples they gave are Route and, and Moffat County, Colorado, what are the steps we could take to get a license, or do we have to wait for the FCC to change the rules? You have to wait. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I, I wish the answer was better. but. Uh, what I do hope is when the, F the, the judgment, and I'm not, you know, I'm a broker and former engineer. I'm not an FCC attorney, but, but the advice that we've gotten from the FCC attorneys is don't do anything now. We expect the FCC is going to release, release this FNPRM. When they do, then that's a time that um, I'll be talking to WISPA, for example, and encouraging WISPA to, you know, issue comments that would be supportive and also would um, – you know, represent the interests of the ISP industry and uh, to encourage the FCC to, you know, finish the rules, get them out there. It, there is, I mean, it's it's a shame, 900 counties with, that are missing channels. It, it, we, we shouldn't have that. It's, it's too bad. Okay. I'm waiting to see if any more questions come in, but I think we've hit the end of the questions. Okay. Great. Well, uh, Bob, I want to thank you for your time today. Again, we will make the presentations uh, available via email, point you to Bob's website, uh, sharing email addresses, all of that information with all of the attendees here today. And uh, once again, would like to thank you for your time and uh, appreciate everyone who came out and, and shared their lunchtime with us today. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Steve. You bet. Bye-bye.